And we are live. This is the official Commando Blog podcast, Saturday night, 7 p.m. EST. Tonight's topic is 3D printed firearms with Ivan the Troll and Stark 1809. Uh, We're going to be talking for a little bit about what they do and uh, what their goals are for 3D printed firearms. So uh, my name is Don with the Commando Blog. And uh, who else do we have here? Uh, my name is Ethan, also with Commando Blog. Uh, I'm Ivan the Troll. I'm from Twitter and Reddit, I suppose. And this is Stark, the man in the shadows. <laughs> awesome. So I guess uh, the best way to start out here would be uh, the further introduction of uh, where did you guys come from? Where did you start? Uh, how did this all start? Yeah, should I start with that? Sure, go right ahead. So I think everything began with Defense Distributed. So like for a few years, 3D printed guns were a thing that were done by Defense Distributed. When Cody Wilson developed a Liberator pistol and showed it to the world, the whole world basically was uh, shocked that a 3D printer something that people knew in sci-fi movies maybe is able to to give you an actual firearm so when defense distributed got popular many of us curious folk were interested and followed this whole ordeal so when uh, cody wilson um, got uh, shut down by the government and defcat went offline he had to fight the government of course and then I personally followed the development. And then Cody Wilson announced that the government allowed him to get DevKit online again. And then there was like a big hype, like DevKit is coming online again. And now we can all download all the guns and, and stuff. And um, it was during that time that I um, was closely following that. And I went on to DevKit in the days prior to the official release of the files. And then Cody Wilson, uh, of course, prematurely uh, uh, put the files online. And there were comment sections uh, below the different firearms. And I thought to myself, it really sucks that there is no like community of do-it-yourself firearms people. And I like left a few messages under a lot of those firearms on DevCat. And then a few people um, responded. And then so like a community community developed of like-minded people. And, and we were excited about DevKit and so on. And then when DevKit got shut, shut down again, we all were pretty bummed about that. And um, yeah, I've, I've, I never really fiddled with CAD software, like software to, to model firearms. And when I, when I took a look at these files, I, I was like, um, like, uh, it was challenging to under, to understand that as a as a person that has never modeled anything or or at that point I think I didn't even 3D print anything, but I was just interested in the topic, so I downloaded various uh, CAD softwares and tried to open the files and I looked at them, and I was really interested about all all of that, and then uh, like like time passed and I, I found out that the actual models were completely wrong like they had so many errors in it like i tried to compare all the different versions of like for example the both in the the defense distributed ar-15 and for some reason they all were slightly different and i asked myself why are they different shouldn't a military bolt of an ar-15 look the same in every model then it dawned to me that maybe these people who are releasing these models for free are releasing them for free because they're shitty or they have faults in them and then it dawned to me that Defense Distributed, or rather Cody Wilson and DevCat, didn't release files that you can actually make firearms with because they're totally out of spec. And the only things that we actually saw in videos where they proved that they could be actually made and used were, I think, a lower receiver, a few mags, and uh, and that's it. And um, and uh, I, I kind of got pissed off about the thing because I was hyped, like I was looking forward to actually getting the files for an AR-15 and, and checking it out. 
And then uh, when I when I realized that the bolt was extremely Hello, faulty, I, I tweeted at Cody Wilson himself. And then he said, uh, uh, yeah, if it's broken, you fix it yourself. I said, you know what? I'm going to do that. And then this <laughs> whole thing started. That is and amazing, honestly. That's a that's a really interesting firsthand account. All going through all of that, and especially us uh, watching from the sidelines, um, seeing all that go down as well. It's a ve very similar feeling. Um, and uh, Ivan, so so that was essentially uh, going on. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? So the, the background I come from was I, I had a 3D printer. So I'm interested in guns since a really young age. Like the classic red-blooded American in the Midwest had a gun since I was in the second grade or whatever. But uh, I, I had a 3D printer for like a year before I ever even thought about, you know, you can print an AR lower on this. Why don't I try? And so that led me down like the rabbit hole of finding Foscad and catching myself up on, because I'd heard about Defense Distributed prior, but I didn't really care until I started, you know, pr printing a lower and then catch myself up on their court drama. And then as chances would have it, they settled with the State Department not soon after that point. And uh, I decided I was good. I decided I'd make a Twitter just as a joke. So I went with like Ivan the troll. So like you know, I'm a Russian bot or whatever. Uh, it, it is a joke. Just to you know follow Cody Wilson and defense distributed and the going ons there. And so then one thing led to another. And so I decided I'd shit post on a couple of uh, Cody's posts or you know people trying to detract from Cody. I decided I'd shit post. You know c cause a little bit of trouble. <laughs> but. Uh, those I eventually ended up sharing, you know, an, an AR-15 lower I had printed, and uh, Jacob Stark then got in contact with me uh, to, through Twitter DMs and invited me to our chat group that we're in, and he had then had that, you know, that tweet with Cody saying, you know, this is wrong, and Cody says, why don't you fix it yourself? And Cody, you know, being himself, having an attitude about it, but uh, <laughs> Jacob and invested. Yeah, and what's funny was that after he gave me that attitude and I described to him what was wrong with it and he told me to fix it myself, he actually slid into my DMs and asked me and told me like, hey, you know what? Here's my number. Let's let's talk about this. And then I had a long personal uh, conversation with him and uh, I we talked about various things and um, I... Actually, we wanted to meet, but unfortunately, before we could meet in real life during an event, um, yeah, the the thing happened that you all know of, and uh, yeah, and that and basically, like, you could say if he didn't get busted or or set up or whatever, like people are, there are rumors. I don't know if that didn't happen. Uh, there would probably be like. Uh, who knows? Maybe I, I would have actually joined Defense Distributed because he talked about actually like informal or formal cooperation. Right. And and the thing was, we talked about the AR-15 and that we need to fix it basically. And uh, we actually had it to a point where we where we thought we could release it, but then this this whole deb debacle happened uh, in, in Taiwan and and that and shortly thereafter I lost contact to him. And then uh, and when he got busted me and the other guys in the community and my associates were pretty bummed. Like, is this the end of do-it-yourself firearms and the 3D printing firearms culture? And, and we, we're, we're a bump. Like, we, we thought everything is lost now. Like, what should we do? And like the freedom fighters we are, we, we thought to ourselves, you know what? We're going to do it. We're going to try to take up the mantle and, and do the things ourselves. And okay. from from that point on, we 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 like the demise of Cody Wilson made us into a unit, you could say. And then this unit started to work on actual projects. Wow. As a, as could have uh, been evidenced by you know torrent sites like the Pirate Bay over the past two decades or anything else. Uh, this is out in the open now, and there's no, it's a hydra. There's no cutting a head off, and that being the end of it. And that's where. Um, you know, DIY firearms, especially 3D printed and CAD models, that's where they're at now, whether it's with a printer or a ghost gunner or whatever else. And you guys are like perfect evidence of that. So it's really right. cool. Absolutely. Um, from the ashes of uh, one project, uh, More Are Born, 
and with the maker community, with uh, people who are involved in 3D printing, this is, and firearms especially, it's just, uh, it's bound to happen. And it's a good thing that no matter what happens, uh, these files, these designs, and the knowledge is out there. Yeah, the, the internet really has enabled us to do crazy things, like pr pretty bad things, but also stuff where where people can uh, can get hope, you know. And uh, and you can, yeah, you can't cut off the head because another one grows, and and uh, you you can't stop this progress. You you can't stop it. If people try are trying to ban stuff, people will go into the lurk in the shadows, and who knows what they will do. And uh, I mean, it, it was New Jersey's magazine ban specifically that made me turn my full attention to printing. And, you know, so, so Defense Distributed had done the printed AR-15 mag. And I'm not sure because, again, Defense Distributed has some weird aversion to documenting the work they do fully. Like, like they don't have they don't like write ups and they don't like read me. So I don't know why that is, but that's them. Cool. But they had used an SLA printer, I believe, for all of their printed magazines. So it's like the resin ultraviolet laser printers, which are a tad more expensive than the FDM, the cheap hot glue gun printers that we're all used to. But uh, they didn't have good documentation saying what material they used, what printer they used, what settings they used. So I, you know, just trying to print their magazine as was in you know ABS, PETG, PLA, whatever, you'd run into these same exact you'd run into the issues that other people had run into where the mag the lips on the magazine crack it feeds like absolute garbage it just doesn't work right. so i had taken a p mag i cut it in half with a chop saw so i could look at the internal geometry on it and lo and behold it's not anything like the defense you know the, the defense distributed mag was not anything like a p mag on the inside and so i figure i'm going to tweak the geometry to make it more on the inside like a p mag tweak the follower so it's more on the inside like a p mag and from there we need to find a material that's then strong enough so that the maglets don't crack. So I think it ended up taking me a good three months of try on error. But in that three months, I was also wondering, because I, I don't know if this is the case uh, in New Jersey or wherever, but I had heard tell of the, the springs for 30-round magazines can be regulated as 30-round magazines themselves. Because, you know, they serve no other purpose. Or yada, yada, what, whatever. really? That was the case? So, so that's what, and, and I read it on AR-15 forums, so 95% chance it's just FUD lore and there's no actual precedent for it. But uh, used to grumpy old people at computers thinking that that might be the case. So I, I decided, so here's the solution. I'll also come up with a way to bend your own magazine springs from 059 diameter uh, music wire. So made the jig to bend up the springs as well, and that found... Uh, also on AR-15 forums, and I was reading about, you know, if any, has anyone tried making a mag from scratch before? I had found, that, you know, the consensus was DuPont Zytel Nylon was the plastic used inside of P-Mags. And some people said it's fiberglass reinforced. Some people said it isn't. When I cut one in half with a chop saw, it didn't look like it was fiberglass reinforced. But maybe they are, and it's just powdered fiberglass. Who knows? I'm not the one to say. But I, I'd found DuPont cells non-glass reinforced at the time dupont only sold non-glass reinforced just standard nylon zytel uh, on on their website well, through a distributor rather but they sell, sell, sold this so it could be you know, used in a 3d printer so i figured you know th this is the opportunity uh, i or ordered a, a roll of this zytel and i printed a mag in it and uh, the, the magazine there that's on screen right now that is the first mag i did in zytel and Lo and behold, just like that, it wanted to function perfectly. Huh. Crazy how that works, right? <laughs> it, it's insane. It, it's because I had tried other nylons, and they and they they would work for 30, 40, 50 rounds, but after a while, you could see the lips start to split and crack just more and more. And eventually, I ran into that with Zytel. And Zytel wants to be printed at like 300 Celsius or hotter, and my Prusa doesn't want to get above 290. Because above 295, 296, the cruisers will shut themselves off because the, the thermistor is not able to tell how hot it's getting at that point. But so, so I printed them at like 287, which was like the hottest my cruiser wanted to stay without giving me errors. And ideally, you print Zytel hotter than that to get better layer adhesion. But I had found 
the Zytel mags would they, they were fragile. So if you loaded 30 rounds in them and then tapped the feed left on a table or whatever, they'd crack just like that. Like, 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 like they'd form the lane. Load 30 rounds in, tap them on a table, and the lips start to crack. So I figured we're going to need a way to make that not happen, of course. And it was when I was trying to like engrave serial numbers on like one of these mags that had had the lips crack all the way off. I was just messing around with the soldering iron, like drawing on it. And so then I, you know, I was sitting there messing with it, and then I looked, went and looked at the cracked feed lip, and I went, huh. And I took the soldering iron, and I soldered the feed lip back on. And I went, hmm, that's interesting. And I, I went and soldered you know, all the way around, because I was amazed, because most plastics, when you hit, hit with a 3D printed plastics, when you hit them with the soldering iron, just want to get stringy and messy. But I guess Zytel, because it has that higher melting temperature, it wanted to fuse together like you were soldering so I went and I sawed I mean, it was a feed lip that was cracked all the way off a magazine. Uh, sawed, not a feed lip, sorry, a magazine lip. And I went and soldered it back onto the top of the magazine and I loaded 30 rounds in it and it didn't split off and it didn't crack again. And it was like, you know, like the lights come down from the heavens and it's like, a, oh, so th this is how you do it. This is the breakthrough that everyone's been waiting for. And I, I, I mean, I've got, I have not used a non printed mag in all of my AR 15 shooting since which has probably been a couple thousand rounds. And I've been tossing between, I've got two final production printed mags that I bounce back and forth between now. But between those two, you know, over a thousand rounds between the two in a 3D printed lower, neither one has split. Now, have you uh, by chance tried to take that to Glock mags, copying the Magpul P mag design? I'm assuming they probably use the same polymer for that, right? Yeah, so, so that's, that's coming next with the little trademark uh, yep. logo. Okay, okay. We can wait. Like, uh, the, the thing was, um, we, we will uh, later during this podcast announce a new design. And for this design, like, the, the, the thing with firearms design is the magazine is the most support, important, as Ian from Forgotten Weapons said. And that's, re that's really true. And we have a firearms design upcoming, and the problem with that firearms design, uh, that design is that we are basing it off of an older one. And I checked out the older one, and I looked at the magwell of that firearm, uh, and and I compared a real life uh, magazine that I have with it, and then I saw that the magwell is actually completely, or not completely wrong, but it 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 isn't in tall like it it doesn't it shouldn't work like that even though when you 3d print it it, uh, it works for some reason so my idea was we need to improve the mag well or or for, for the new farms design we need we need a 3d model of the proper magazine and then i i told ivan like uh, hey uh, could you do me a favor and and buy that uh, that uh, glock magazine and uh, model it so I can design the uh, the macro for upcoming farm and and funny enough he bought a Glock 17 magazine and he modeled it actually because and and I, I was surprised and and the, the thing is I wanted to model it myself but modeling like complex shapes like a magazine is so effing difficult and Ivan is so talented that he could uh, he was able to to model it up and then we only had the uh, the actual magazine body but that was all i needed for the, for the magwell and then and then funny enough ivan tried to to print it even though he didn't he didn't have even have an actual glock that uses that magazine and that was <laughs> that was the start of 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 the glock parts even yeah. though like and what's crazy is that at that point he only uh, used like 1911s and actually didn't like the idea of owning a Glock. <laughs> right, so, so to elaborate on that a little, I, I bought the two Glock mags and I was just going to do the same thing I did with the AR-15 mags. Chop saw one and a half to get the internals and then take the one to get the, you know, the externals right. And so I had done that uh, and I figured, you know, th this is a reference model only because of course Glock mags have the metal liners on the inside. If you print it so the dimensions are the same, it won't have that metal liner. But I went ahead and did it anyway. And it would it would feed so long as you didn't put more than five rounds into it. And I printed them in like EBS or whatever, just something quick and dirty, not not the Zytel, just because Zytel is expensive. Yeah. But ju just then and there, that's a proof of concept because even ABS was strong enough that it didn't want to break. The issue was wh where it becomes a double stack into a single feed because double stack to single feed is the most difficult magazine design I think there is. But my, my problem then became I was just using like a screwdriver to push on the end of cartridges like it was a round pickup or just using my thumb to feed the rounds out of the mag. And so I realized, well, I need to get myself a Glock. So my first instinct was like, well, I just need to do a P80. But then I remembered 
like three months before that, there had been a guy who had hit me up in my DMs who, who, who had printed Glock frames before. And he had, so he had, he had modeled them so they accept like P80 frame or P80 rails, except he had lost that CAD as well as the CAD for like a DIY make your own rail system Glock frame whenever his computer crashed. So he had the STLs for them, but he didn't have, you know, actual object, actual like yeah. part models for them. Yeah. Which is, of course, a great big pain in the ass. But it's a lot harder to go from one back to the original. Right. So, so he had said that you know he'd get me as much CAD as I could. I, you know, we could work on building a Glock and we could work on getting it to FOSCAT. So I said, you know, of course, yeah, let's do it. That would be awesome. So we went forward with it, and I was thinking it would be a, a you know a one and done deal. But the, you know, the case was the last uh, model file he had for this do-it-yourself rail system. I guess I should back up. Get, we were given the choice between the Polymer 80 rail system and the do-it-yourself rail system, which to focus on first, and both he and I agreed, while the Polymer 80 rail system would be useful to a whole lot of people, in order to get Polymer 80 rails, you have to buy a Polymer 80 kit, because they won't just sell you their rails separate. Mm -hmm. So you know, so, so we, we arrived at the conclusion that we can do the Polymer 80 frame. It's not like we're going to say, screw it, that's not worth anything. But we, we arrived at the conclusion that we should do this do-it-yourself rail system first, simply because... In the long run, it will be more useful to the DIY community than the people who already have Glocks. The, because I mean, at least for me, at least for me in particular, like Jacob was saying, I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm I'm like a glorified boomer is what I am because I like 30 odd six and I think 45 is the best and the 1911 is the best handgun ever made hands down no debate. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Which of course uh, made made me not want to buy a Glock, let alone build a Glock, because you know it's like silly Austrian garbage. It's not even. I don't get it. <laughs> Why do people think polymer guns are crap? I, I don't really get it, man. These boomers, man. <laughs> so or rather zoomer. So, so 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 I was basically fud posting in real life, and so I you know, we went ahead. We did this Glock project, and I can now say, uh, with great disappointment to myself and my ancestors, that uh. The, the, I shoot much better with the Austrian plastic handgun than I do with the 1911, by far. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and, and maybe that's just because I've got a lot of practice in a short time mm -hmm. with, the, with the new gun, but maybe it's also because I have a little bit more confidence in it because I built it. I don't know. couldn't tell you why. I shoot much better with it than with any of the 1911s I yeah, I was going to comment. It's also, you know, it makes more sense for this type of kit to use your own DIY reel because... In the case of Paul Meridi, like you said, people are going to buy the P80 kit. They probably don't have interest in the whole printing a gun, printing a frame. Um, so it, it does, it makes a lot of sense to me, at least, uh, about how you guys went through the struggle of trying to create this. Um, and I th yeah, the, the whole idea of, of, of our work is to enable the everyday common man around the world, wherever he may be, to produce entire firearms, or at least produce as many or as, as much of, an, of, of a firearm as possible. So we always think of how can we improvise and how can we change this design so people can can I don't know use tools use tools and parts from the from the hardware store, and right. uh, and in this case, going with a DIY rails was a was a decision that had to be made because obviously you couldn't buy P80 rails and and if it's a challenge we accept it and and uh, yeah that's awesome um, Okomi in the comments did have a uh, question they said uh, stupid question but at what temperature does the magazine material start to melt or near the bolt he says can it withstand a whole he said clip but magazine shot quickly so yeah, so I, I've even got that video of where I take the mag, disassemble it, reassemble it, load it with 30 rounds, put it in the gun, and you know, dump 30 rounds. Uh, I'm trying. I'll have, uh, I mean, I might be wrong because off the top of my head, Zytel's glass transition temperature is 220 Fahrenheit to 300 Fahrenheit. I think somewhere in that range. So you, you, it has to be hot enough that it would boil water before Zytel quits acting like a solid. And so I've, I've put those Zytel mags, part of their post-processing is if you throw them in water, it'll smooth out the layer lines on the inside of the mag and help it feed a little better. I've put these mags in boiling water, so 212-ish degrees. No, weak, no, no weakness of the plastic at all. So I've taken it out of the 212-degree water, and I've tried squishing it, bending it. 
it you know it comes back to shape. It is not weakened at all at 212 degrees. So if you get your AR-15s magazine well for some reason to 212 degree, you know above 212 degrees, you might have a problem. But bear in mind at that point, your handguard would be like 400 degrees and probably on fire. Yeah, if you had a getting, plastic handguard, it would be really getting, hard, really hard to get the lower that high. Yeah, or the top of the mag as well near the feed lips. And it's just, the P mags are, have to bear the same temperature and are made out of the same material. I'll be through a different process, but right, I mean, yeah, P mags don't melt. Wouldn't change the melting temperature much at all. And I don't yeah. mean to sound like I don't mean to sound like um, well that's a stupid fucking question. It's a good question. It's a valid question, but in this case, there's no there's no issues with heat. At least just not for the mag. Yeah, you have to you realize like. The bolt of an AR-15 interlocks with the locks on on the barrel, and and like the magazine is too far away from that whole interaction to get so much heat that it's gonna melt. Yeah. Because ideally, so, so here now I'm gonna roast defense distributed a little bit. So, on a real AR-15, the bolt should never touch the magazine. Unless you're defense distributed and you model a bolt that has to travel through its magazine. Oh man, that whole project was such a nightmare. Like, <laughs> seriously, like the first thing I talked about was the bolt, right? So, and the bolt itself was so shitty, we had to think of it. And we, we tried to, to grab a few bolts from all over the internet and look at them. And every single one of them was completely faulty. So, I myself, who never actually modeled something, who never really had anything to do with, with Fusion 360 or SolidWorks or whatever, I learned from, from basically from scratch, from nothing, how to CAD just so I can fix that bolt. And we actually did it. We actually have a bolt now which is true to spec. And if you had a 3D metal printer or had a 5-axis um, CNC, you could actually machine it. And you can actually have a working firearm. While on the other hand, with the defense distributed AR-15, basically, basically only like the pistol grip and maybe the, the stock body and everything else is trash. Not nothing you can use there, to be honest. And the biggest nightmare for Ivan was the effing upper receiver yeah. and lower receiver. Oh upper, my god! The upper receiver was complete hot garbage. I cannot stress to you enough. And. And so, so if you've watched the new Radical, which, by the way, I highly recommend anyone interested in Cody Wilson and his rhetoric, watch the new Radical. It's on Vimeo. It's like a documentary on him and his early days especially, but it's, it's just amazing. But it, it, somewhere towards like the later three-fourths of that, he mentions this website, cncguns.com, where he goes on and he says, like, oh, here's, you know, here's the upper and lower receiver for an AR-15 in IGES format or whatever. And so... Believe it or not, that, that upper, which was posted in 2003, was the same exact upper that was on that defense distributed AR that they released in uh, July. So it's not a correct upper at all. The guy from CNC Gunsmith said he made the upper and that he put a barrel on it and put a bolt carry in it, but he never made oh, it. Shit. He never made it to a lower. So you could, you could put everything in it. I don't think a charging handle wouldn't fit. I don't think he weighed enough to put a charging handle in there because the track was wrong. Yeah, you could, put, you could put a carrier in there. You could put a barrel on there. That that part was right, but the the recesses for the mag, and of course, it's hard to describe without you guys all having a lower in front of you. But whenever you put a mag into a lower, there's little cutouts made by like a quarter inch ball nose end mill in the top yep. of the upper that the mag the mag lips sort of rest inside. On defense distributed upper, there was like a, the, 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 those those well, not the defense distributed uppers, the CNC gunsmith upper. Those those uh, recesses needed to be at least another quarter inch higher than they were. Of course, they were a quarter inch lower than they needed to be. So the mag clipped through the upper just a hilarious amount. Like, a, is the mag wrong? Is the upper wrong? I mean, it was bad. Man, yeah. Every time, like, like it was like this. I was working with the assembly, and I said, this part is missing. This part is missing. Okay, let's let's add that. And then I always, like... I always do that. I take um, a plane and then I basically virtually cut the rifle in half, so yeah, I can cross take section. A, yeah. a cross section. Yeah, so I can take a deep look at it. And every now and then I check out the different part, and then I said, "Hmm, that looks kind of weird. That clips. What the hell? What's wrong with that?" And I take a screenshot and I, I tell Ivan, "Hey, would you look at that? Is that normal?" 
and he said, oh, fuck, we have to fix that. His, and then exact, he, his exact words were, is that normal? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so and the, the funny thing is, while he's fixing that, he's, he's, uh, um, while he's fixing that, I'm, I'm still looking at the rifle, and then Ivan, a few hours later, sends me, like, the, the, the corrected part, and I put it into assembly, and then the moment he sends the corrected part, I tell him, dude, is that, is that normal as well? And Ivan goes, what the fuck? And then he has to work again. And that went like, seriously, like for weeks. And it was, and the, it, it was, it was at least three weeks of just like that. Every day after I got back from school or work, wherever it was that I was that day. Like, you know, so five, six hours up until past midnight, three or four in the morning some nights. Yeah. It was just back and forth. Like, oh, I fixed this part. I sent it, sent it back to him. And he says, was this normal? Is this supposed to be like that? And so I'm sitting there with a half a symbol AR in front of me with a fully assembled AR on the other side, looking back and forth between them like, no, this is not supposed to look like this. And you know what's, what's the worst thing? At that point, we didn't even have actual blueprints. Yeah, so, so, so we, at that point, we had not been past the technical data pack for the M16, A1, and A2. So any part that we were modeling at that point was just done with calipers and... Uh, the the, the for, you know, force reverse engineering you call it right it's crazy it's crazy that like two guys have to have to fix the mess of actual companies that produce models like the CNC uh, gun guy and and defense distributed uh, Cody Wilson goes like we've put the AR-15 in the public domain you put <laughs> you put shit into public domain man <laughs> that, that guy seriously. All props to, to Cody Wilson and his work, but that guy is so f f uh, full of himself that he puts shit out there and then he expects us to, to piss his he, 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 he put shit out there and knew it was shit because in my conversation with him, he, he knew it was hot garbage. <laughs> he put shit out there, he knew it was shit, and he went and bragged about it with a straight face and in a se serious tone of voice, the host, host the files or pay, pay the tax for them. But, but you know, you know what's funny? What was that? You know, you know what's funny about all this? Yeah. That the actual files actually didn't have to be correct, because all like basically his point was to agitate the, the media, and the media bought into it. That's they didn't true. even check the files. They didn't even ask like a hey, hey, a firearms expert or um, barrel producer or firearms producer. Hey, look at these files. Can you really make an AR-15 from it? They didn't even do that once. Not even once. Not even today they do that. Like, the press is so fucking retarded. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. The, the, barrel, the barrel didn't have a chamber at all. It was just like rifling cut all the way to the, the end of the, you know, both ends of the barrel had rifling cut all the way to it. There wasn't a chamber on that And barrel. that issue again, that issue again was something like I told you already. Like, we, we thought we were, we were completed with the AR-15. Like, a couple months actually went by where we thought we had the AR-15 completed. Like, we had that project... Uh, on on hold, in in stasis, and then I looked at the rifle and and uh, uh, and even the, the like it's the most important part after the bolt, and I looked at the rifle and I looked at the at the at the rifling, and the chamber, and I realized it's fucked up, and then I sent a screenshot to Ivan again, and then we we got the project uh, out of stasis, and then it continued. It was it was really a nightmare, and you know what's the, what's the funniest thing. Up to the last second of the AR-15 release, we fixed problems <laughs> with uh, under so true. much time yeah. pressure. It, it was the night before, and we had found like what one pinhole was, you know, the same exact. It was the auto sear pinhole, I think. It was the auto sear bushing rather? The, basically, so the entire fire control group. Right, like the pinholes and pin sizes were just slightly off on the fire control group. You know, just just simple stuff that we never had thought to check. And, and I mean, it was it was off by like thousandths of an inch. I think like the because a, a normal fire control pin is like a 0.245. That's wrong. And you have to realize, like with right. firearms, like if you build AR-15s, if if there is like a, an error of a few thousands, the part won't work, or the pin won't get in, or the pin will will be loose, slip out, or loose. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's it's such a precise work that what this defense distributor released that it was so fucking wrong. Like, it was crazy, and uh, we're very lucky that we got that technical data package uh, to our hands. 
I don't know if you guys uh, wanted to discuss this at all later, but it came to mind earlier when you were talking about uh, your talks with Cody. But has there been any more talk with uh, anyone at Defense Distributed since his departure? And so there, there yeah, has been a bit. I'll, I'll take the first part of this, and Jacob can cover up with his discussion with him. But we've got a contact there that Cody had set us up with, as well as uh, Paloma, Jacob has talked to. And in general, and, and I don't want to you know badmouth these guys at all, because of course they're they're busy in court, and there's things course, that they legally cannot do, such as share files. But the, the the feeling that I got in my conversations with them post Cody was. They don't really care about having accurate files right now. They care yeah. about selling ghost gunners, which which makes sense. I can't fault them for that. They're paying king's ransoms in legal fees. I have yeah. no doubt. Right, very fair. So, and, and you, I mean, you make like five dollars a day off of a file. You make, you know, however much money, it's a couple hundred bucks off of each ghost gunner. Market the ghost gunners. Don't market the files. Plus, you can't really market the files without getting in a whole lot of trouble. And they also know that there's the community surrounding them that will alter files as needed to work. Right, and, and, and see, I, th th at this point, they can almost count on us to yeah. do the fixing of the files. To do that anyway. dirty work, basically. Right, they, they can almost just forget well, about doing it. Yeah, which, how this whole thing be began, you know? Yep. Uh, do you want me to put those uh, 3D renders on screen for the AR-15? Sure, sure. Sure. And maybe maybe I'll, I'll open the stream, mute it, uh, and maybe we can talk about the parts sure. or something. Cool. Do you uh, have a link uh, ready for that stream? Uh, I'll drop it in the Discord here. Yeah, I was going to do that if you didn't. Bueno. Well, look at that. At the very least, so, so well, even after we released it, like probably about 50% of the Twitter responses that I got, like the comments were, you know, what, what printer do I need for this? How can you print this? Or the people who know that you can't print it being intentionally antagonistic saying, oh, you can't <laughs> print that. You can't print that. That's not a working gun. This doesn't even matter. This isn't even a big deal. Yeah, what That's, you have to realize is... It's, it's a reference model, and, and I yeah. even specifically made that clear. In 10 years, when laser metal centering, exactly. laser centering printers get cheaper, it could be possible that you can just run one of these off on a printer that costs less than a car. At this point in time, that's obviously not even close to the case. But for now, what this is, is it's a reference model. So if you wanted to make, uh, you know, if you wanted to try and optimize an AR-15 upper for printing in plastic, you should start with this upper, then reinforce it as you need because starting from scratch, it would be an absolute pain. Or if you wanted to make like a new hand guard, or if you wanted to make like a thumb hole stock, this would be the place to start with, because you know that buffer tube is in the right spot, and you know that lower is in the right spot. You know that everything here is good and kosher and right with the Lord, and that whatever changes you want to make, whatever you want to build around it, will fit and will work like it is supposed to. But and, be, ad be advised, uh, a few parts of that firearm that aren't involved with the actual um, discharge of a shot, like, for example, the pistol grip, that's yeah, not so completely kosher. The pistol, so, grip, so, the pistol so, grip doesn't have the palm swell like the actual AR-15 pistol grip does, and that comes back to we had the technical data plans for an, AR, an M16 A1 or A2, yep. which had like that stupid-ass lanyard hole grip that yep. didn't have a palm swell, so we could model that one. But if we throw that on this model, it will look hideously out of place. You know, anyone that knows guns will go, uh, why? So to avoid the uh, why, we took this one, which looks like the real deal, but doesn't have a palm swell model, simply because this is usable, this, work, this works, and this looks right. Exactly. You, know? you could, for example, print that pistol grip, and it would actually work. Also, I mean, it's a pistol grip. There's a million to one right. on the commercial yeah. market. That is the least of anyone's concerns. But when dude, maybe maybe you want to modify it and put like uh, waifu images <laughs> into it, extruded or something. You, you know the guys on K. Come on, uh, you know yeah. that. Oh yeah. So, yeah, but uh, it's, it's awesome, and I know firsthand some of the issues that, like you guys discussed earlier, just having a pinholes in the wrong spots or something just when when you have a 12 hour print that finishes and uh you run it oh this doesn't fit 
and you, you just bash your head and you're like, start again, you know, or have to go modify it. So if you look in, in that ren render, you can make out the fire control group, right? And like many firearm assemblies out there, like if you look inside them, they don't even have springs. And my point that I wanted to make, like I'm the kind of guy who, if, if the assembly is not 100% complete, I don't give a fuck about it. And it was my goal for myself to have an AR-15 assembly that has every single spring, every single uh, pin, every single screw, whatever inside of there. So, so I tried to look around on the internet for those spring kits that you can get. Like I looked at the images, how many curls they have, and at, I searched on various forums, like what the wire gauge is, so that I could send this information to Ivan, and then Ivan modeled them and then sent them uh, to me and I put it into the assembly. And then the issue was you have to actually account for the, uh, what's it called? If it's compressed or non-compressed. So you have to play with that. And then my idea was if we put springs in there, we should all, uh, also have uh, the springs in their non-compressed form. So you can like for the magazine uh, spring that you can make jigs and then uh, wind your own springs. So the idea with this, uh, with this firearm is that if you have every single part in there, every single spring, you could potentially um, recreate it with with uh, with adventurous ways, like ingenious ways. And the magazine spring was the first step. And, and I guess that's the case. That that's the case with any reference model. Is the idea is with unlimited resources, like a five hundred thousand dollar CNC machine or a million dollar laser metal printer you could make everything you see here. So you could make a working AR-15 with unlimited resources with the information in the data pack that we released. Which, of course, like, you know, like, like I had said, it, it draws out the antagonist in people because they'll say, well, you, know, you can't 3D print that. Well, no, I can't. No, most people can't. I mean, if you're, like, uh, if you're, if you're GE and you have a printer big enough to print jet engines, yes, GE could probably turn this rifle out. Just that the point is, you have to be a millionaire, and if you've got a million dollars, you can just buy a whole bunch of bulk AR-15s, and the battle's won that way as well. So it's, you know, again, more of a reference model than a, I'm going to go out and build bunches of these with this. But even still, that gets back to, I, I don't know if you guys had seen it, but I had Bob Menendez, the senator out of New Jersey, specifically named my Twitter account in a letter saying that, <laughs> so he wrote a letter to the Twitter CEO, Jack Dorsey saying that my my files, my specific files from Ivan the Troll 12 on Twitter were nefarious and potentially dangerous and that I had to be censored and deplatformed, blah, blah, blah. I, I have to be kicked off and Twitter needs to rein in this dangerous sharing of gun files. Have you printed that out and framed it yet? The AR-15? Uh, you know I'm working no, on it. No, no, he's talking about the tweet. <laughs> the, tweet. Oh, the, the latter. Yeah, I need to print that out and frame it. To, yeah. to, to be actually honest, you should wait until some higher profile guy actually tries to sue him or call call him out because I think that Menendez or whatever his name is, I didn't even know him before that. I, I, knew, I know about uh, Gruval, the, 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 what, the sick the dude. Or, or attorney General of New Jersey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew about him, but I... I Menendez, I've never heard about that guy. Would it be but okay this... to put that tweet on screen? Oh yeah, go for it. In in that letter, the the, the New Jersey uh, senator, so he, he's a federal senator. He's he's like a United States senator from New Jersey. He uh he he said that these were three D printable files that could be used to make guns. But it's hilarious because with the tweet that I you know see because he he mentioned the two tweets so I had made a tweet the day before and I made a tweet the day of that was like you know the, the launch tweet the announcement tweet like here it is with the download link I specifically said in that tweet and the following tweets that this isn't a printable gun you cannot print this this is a reference model maybe in ten years it could be affordable to print it you can't print this now that's not feasible it's not what this is about this is a reference model so other gun designers can base their designs around it. I, that, I think, I think it even that. says it in the re written, readme fields, right? That yeah, this in, is just in, a reference. In the readme, there's like a there's a bulletin with bold letters. Don't try and print this; it's not going to make you a yeah. gun. But That's but hilarious. that doesn't matter. To, that doesn't matter to these people. So even with multiple disclaimers saying you can't print this, you know what the senator says is it looks like a gun. Therefore, it's a printable gun. Therefore, it's and I quote, nefarious and potentially dangerous. And you know what's what's really, really sweet about this? Kind of ironic. 
that the technical data package that we used to mo uh, model a few parts of this gun and, and, and actually to ensure that it's on spec, those, this te technical data uh, package, this, these blueprints from the army actually came from New Jersey. Yeah, I mean, in, in the technical data pack, there's a release form signed by some army pencil pusher in New Jersey. <laughs> Wonderful. That that is uh that is stellar. This compounding irony. I love it. I love it. Absolutely. Actually, to tag on to that, uh, one of our contributors did also have a, a question within like the same realm of that. Uh, and feel free to you know if you don't want to comment on it or not, it's all good. Uh, he asked, uh, "Are you scared at all of repercussions from the United States government or from wherever?" they come from like we saw that with uh say cody wilson went through and uh what could happen like what are your takes on the publicity of it all and uh, how you'd handle it personally i don't think it's a big enough a de big enough deal for any one so, so i'm one person right maybe i've got like two or three associates we don't have a company our names aren't publicly known my identity isn't publicly known i don't care to make it publicly known I don't think that any of these anti-gun attorney generals have the resources to dox me, find out personal details about me. Even if they had those resources, I don't think it's worth the money for them to do it because right, what have I done? Enough. I've shared non-printable files on the internet. But even if, so let's say one thing comes to another, comes to another, and they do do this, they do try and come after me, they, sit, they, you know, they find out my real name and they send me a cease and desist, I guess at that point I've got a decision to make, right? Do I follow in Cody Wilson's steps? Do I say, oh, yes, I'll comply with the cease and desist and make Ivan the Troll 13 and get right back to it. I mean, I'd, I'd have decisions at that point. And what you have to realize is, the fun thing is, even if Ivan stopped, like, who knows how big our group, the Terrence Dispensed, is. Like, he could send one file uh, encrypted to another individual around the globe, and that person would release the files. Can the U.S. government do anything about it? No, fuck no. So there's no point. Hmm. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, you know, more harm is done in the pirating of movies than in the sharing of firearms data, because this is a point I bring up in practically every argument I get into on Twitter. No one has ever been harmed by a printed gun, including the people shooting printed guns. So no Very one's lost a finger. Point. No one's, no one's blown a hand off. No one's, no one's so much as bruised their hand. Absolutely. When, when I've been, I've, I've been using a screwdriver to scrape out the insides of a hole, and I've stabbed myself with a screwdriver making a printed gun. I, and I think that's the extent of injuries when using printed guns. Is I, I, I scratched a finger with a screwdriver and bled a little bit. What there's, you have there's, to... there's been no one hurt making these guns. There have been millions of dollars in profits lost in pirating movies. Now, whatever, whatever. Corporations aren't people, and they deserve to lose that money. I agree, but there are at least some damages there. There's at least some harm done there. They can't stop where actual harm is going on. They can't stop you from pirating a movie any more than they can stop me from uploading the Glock data tomorrow. They're not going to be able to do anything about it. What you have to realize is that guns, do-it-yourself guns, are, are being made or today in Brazil, in the favelas. Like there, are, like there are a few Twitter accounts, like Calibra, Obscura, whatever, where he shows pics of uh, Bra Brazilian gangsters using submachine guns that they built. Right. Those are those guns actually kill people. Like guns that you actually built in a machine shop and not some three D printing uh, files on the internet. Like the, the politicians have no clue about the real world out there and what's actually dangerous and what's actually not. Hundred percent. Tube guns made from uh, pipe found in hardware stores are what is really prevalent and what has always been. Ever you know, the whole idea of the Sten was exactly that. And that's like, what's being copied exactly like yep. you said around the world. The the these printed guns are they're they at least for the time being, maybe someday things will get bad enough to where it is economically viable, but it's a, it's always going to be more of a statement than anything else. It, it's possible and there's no stopping this, especially I gotta, the, I gotta tell you that's gonna change very soon, not far in the future, but very soon because we will announce that thing. In the, during this podcast <laughs> oh yeah that, that's true <laughs> absolutely the shift from symbolic to practical and both and that, of course and that's another thing that i want to touch on before getting to the release is printed guns is like in and of itself in a confusing term because like, like whenever somebody says like a polymer handgun 
they don't mean it's got a polymer barrel. They mean that it's got a polymer frame or just the, like a polymer AR-15 is like just a polymer lower, like, you know, a G-Wax lower or whatever. And so it becomes incredibly misleading because I, I, I say, when I, whenever I say like, you know, I went shooting, I say I went shooting with my printed AR-15 because it's got a printed lower. And I'm sure everyone listening is familiar with the ATF rules, but let's say someone isn't. You know, the ATF says there's one part of the gun that's the gun and everything else is just a peripheral. It's not a gun. So on, on an AR-15, it's the lower receiver. On a Glock, it's the frame. So, you know, each one of these parts individually is printed. And so whenever you print it, by legal definition, it is a printed gun. So a uh, printed gun then ranges in a legal sense and in a realistic sense to, for, you know, from the liberator, which is plastic barrel, plastic body, plastic grip, plastic hammer, plastic fire control group all the way with a metal firing pin and the metal that's non-functional to make it so it's detectable by a metal detector all the way to, you know, an AR-15 where I printed the lower and the rest I bought from Palmetto State Armory on a sale. Yep. And, and yep. everything in between. So and just foreshadowing what we're going to announce here in a little bit, it, it could be a do-it-yourself gun that uses printed parts in combination with metal parts. And really that's what the Glock is, is it uses those metal rails in conjunction I guess you could say it's like a composite. It's got the, the polymer frame with the metal rails. And whenever you put those two together, it, it, it becomes something that's easy to make because it's printed as well as something robust because it's metal. Yeah, there, there's, there's uh, that misconception, but um, I think for most part, the people who are going to be listening are going to understand the, what, what the, we're referencing. Right. And, and, and admittedly, you know, you can't change the fact that the Liberator is a one or two shot weapon. The Songbird, you can get like nine shots of 22 out of a nylon barrel. So, you know, some people get almost you know 20 shots or more out of just the nylon barrel. But for the most part, printed guns will remain in that realm where they're limited usability whenever they're entire. Uh, unless it's something like the Glock frame or an AR lower, where it's a very low stress part, relatively speaking, versus right. everything else. There's a thing oftentimes when we talk about 3D printed firearms and do-it-yourself firearms. Like I, I, I'm reading the chat, and is it okay if I answer a question in the chat from yeah, the chat? Absolutely. Feel free. So, so one guy asks, "What about homemade homebrew ammo?" And I think that's a key point. I think that's one of the most important points in terms of do-it-yourself firearms because the issue is, if you have a firearm and no ammo, what the fuck are you going to do with it? So that's one thing I early on tried to take a stab at it. And what you have to realize is the history of, of ammo. And before we used smokeless powder, we used black powder, right? And black powder you can actually make from scratch. So the thing is, in many countries around the world, ammo is of course regulated, such as also like firearm parts. And the thing is, what's not regulated is are the individual components of black powder. And in some countries you can buy cases, in some countries you can buy primers. So if you've got black powder, cases and primers, and then take some lead, for example, like you can cast your own lead bullets, you can make your own ammo. And the idea is there are calibers which you can actually today make for modern firearms where you can actually use black powder as your propellant. And, then this, uh, and that is 38 uh, special and 12 gauge uh, shot shells. So for the guy who's asking about homebrew ammo, if you go with a firearm for 38 special and 12 gauge uh, shotguns, you can make your own um, black powder and then use empty uh, shot shells. Actually, there's a guy from Foskett called Jeff Roth. He's, he, um, he done a project where he 3D prints single shot shotgun shells. So you have a path to homebrew ammo, but you have to uh, focus, your, uh, focus on 38 special and 12 gauge and other black powder cartridges. So at that point, it's entirely possible to, to, uh, to do that. The issue about nitrocellulose is that it's extremely dangerous and you, you need to be a chemist to understand that or even try to attempt that. So maybe Ivan, you know maybe uh, more about trying to attempt to recreate smokeless so, powder? So in general, and I, I really the Anarchist Cookbook as well as the, the Murder Cube has excellent you know, sections on making nitrocellulose. And I think really like the first paragraph well, at least in the version of the Anarchist Cookbook I read, the first paragraph was probably the most useful. 
because it said don't do it because you're going to blow yourself up because you know static discharge you so, so static discharge so light you can't feel it will blow up nitrocellulose and it will blow up blow up and so like the first paragraph says go ahead and don't do this this is for reference only and i think that's the paragraph to read and pay attention to black powder safe relatively easy to make nitrocellulose not smart so I posted a picture there in the chat, actually, and um, th this is uh, one of my friend Jim's pictures, and our friend Max, uh, Max I believe is actually listening right now, um, also did this, and we fired it out of my Glock, but we actually 3D printed bullets. Well, Max 3D printed the bullets. This is Jim's project uh, pictured. If Don wanted to pull that up, that'd be fine. Um, but we actually uh, took a whack at 3D printing bullets for like nine millimeter and uh, shooting them with range just for, you know, shits and giggles. And it actually works splendidly both um, with this, you know, test case of primer, one grain and two grains of powder. Um, they shot straight at five to 10 yards and it, it, they didn't, you know, cycle the gun, obviously. Uh, but it was kind of a proof of concept in much the same way that everything that you know we're kind of discussing is uh it's like there's no stopping it and then um as you were talking about earlier as far as components you know cases uh primers powder printing bullets is just one less thing you need to acquire um, whether they are effective or not is a different discussion but it, it exists i'd say but, black black powder cartridges you can definitely make deadly like b back in the day, basically. 100, so. Oh, 100 percent. And honestly, with black powder in something like a nine millimeter case with a 3D printable, that pressure is going to be relatively low. It might 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 not be efficient, and it might not be enough to cycle your um, delayed blowback nine. But it's but with going to be better. Blowback in a correctly tuned spring, I guarantee you. you oh, 100 percent, 100 percent. And that would be easy as well when you're talking straight blowback. So. You they, don't even need a blowback to make a to make a firearm that is able to uh, to shoot multiple shots in a row. Like Jeff Roth from Foscat, shout out to him. He's working on a on a three D printed like semi three D printed shotgun that has a revolver drum. Yeah, and then you pump, can pump action revolving shotgun. Yeah, that's a pretty good idea because the issue is if you were to make your own black powder shotgun shells, right? The issue is if you made it like a Remington 870 copy or like a semi-auto shotgun, it wouldn't work because the black powder would mess up um, the action and uh, there would be a lot of lot, lots of soot inside the action. And the good thing about revolver action is, is that um, yeah, th there's not such an issue because every shotgun shell ha has its own uh, chamber and uh, and it's it's lot it's a lot cleaner than pump action traditional pump action shotguns and uh, and semi-autos. Also, uh, talking about the components, there's primer compound that can be made from matches and stuff. Um, our friend yeah. Buki posted in our Twitch stream that there's a there's a few videos of 1911s that are reloaded with black powder that are fully functional. That exists. Yeah, so. I believe if you put like a like well, probably even like a 22 recoil spring in there, I bet I bet you'd get it to cycle right. Well, I mean, I with a full 45 1911, I believe that cartridge was you know developed back in time when um yeah i mean know. yeah yeah, yeah, right about that. yeah. wasn't near as high pressure yeah exactly I, you're they're they're because mod, modern loading of 45 is like you, you barely fill the cartridge halfway up it's not like nine millimeter modern yeah. loading which are compressed yeah, yeah. it's true 45 acp kind of works with black powder that's true like with nine millimeter it's a whole different ball game yeah, i don't think with, you'd ever get nine mil to work yeah but 45 i bet you tough. could if if you compress loaded black powder in a 45 i bet it would suck yeah, well, with 45 SCP, it does cycle, actually. I and, think and, Hickok 45 showed that, I think. And also, uh, getting the, getting back to, like, even if it might not cycle with a normal 9mm case and bullet and, you know, 17-pound recoil spring or whatever, if you're going through this amount of effort to make something work, you will find a way to make it work. Right. As you guys are a perfect testament to that. So. Yeah, I think the, the future is bright. Like... Who knows? Like, for example, uh, they're talking about organic printers, like uh, making like uh, hearts for people, like baby hearts or something, like putting cells in a, in a 3D uh, kind of printed uh, scaffold and stuff like that. Who knows? Maybe someday, uh, like instead of like bigger macro org organisms, you could, I don't know, make chemicals with a 3D printer. Like just watch sci-fi 
10, 10 years from now. So who knows? Maybe we will, someday we'll be able to get our hands on on uh, nitrocellulose, uh, smokeless powder. And then Perhaps. the whole hammer question is, is, is an easier one. Or may, maybe even a superior propellant to that even, to, to smokeless powder. Who knows? So the ammo question, it can be solved, guys. So everybody that asks out there, what about the ammo? We can't buy ammo here. What, what should I do with the firearm? If you concentrate on, on certain calibers and certain firearms design, everything is possible. Where there is a will, there's a way. It doesn't, yeah. you, don't ha you don't need to, to worry about loss. If, if you have the motivation, if you want freedom, if you want to be a free man who can defend himself, and actually be a, a person that is able, able to protect himself from tyranny or from criminals or whatever. If you have the will and motivation to protect yourself and your family, you will do that. And there are people out there who, who will try to help you. And, and it's, a, it's a whole global community of, of anarchists, of, of, uh, of Bitcoin uh, guys and whatever is out there. It's a, it's a bright future. There is, there is negative things as you've seen in the last few days, but there is also positive positive stuff, stuff out there in the, in the global internet community. Absolutely. We definitely got to keep that fire lit for uh, those to show the, the light of uh, how positive this can be for the world. And in light of all the negative things that happened, especially recently, um, why we believe the things we do, why we do the things we do uh, to advance uh, firearms design and to make it more available to the public. It's uh, it's an unfortunate thing that uh, that many out there don't understand the gravity of how important it is for self defense to be a viable option for for people out there using this type of technology, uh, regardless of laws, regardless of opinions of uh, many out there. So people don't want to be victims. Um, yeah, and when they reach the point of taking it upon themselves to not have, you know, some type of unfortunate event happen to them, but because of where they live, they might not be able to access something as freely as we can, like, you know, going to an LGS and picking up a, a firearm, things like this uh, effectively empower them to do so. And that is a good thing. Um, people reach the point of not caring if something uh, isn't necessarily like clearly criminals don't care, but now with citizens, they will reach the point of, well, it's not stopping them. Why should it stop me? And uh, that happens both in our country uh, in more restrictive states like New York and California, and then also internationally. And um, people in political power may not like that. And figureheads in the media may uh, fear monger about that. But in reality, this, this is good for the greater collective, uh, in my honest opinion. Yeah, to be honest, fuck gun control. <laughs> and you know what? Fuck gun control, FGC. That is the new <laughs> name of our upcoming pistol caliber carbine. Oh, yes. yeah. Let's get that. Introduce the photos. <laughs> oh, the render. There you go. <laughs> Release the photos. This is uh, going to be really neat. So I, I should preface by saying... We've mentioned Jeffrod like 20 times now, but I should give like an official mention of Jeffrod. So he's a guy at Foscat who knows a whole lot about a whole lot. And uh, his his whole pr premise, like the stuff he's working on right now, he calls it the third world armory. So he wants to do everything using what he calls like tier one tools, like hacksaws, uh, metal files, maybe a Dremel tool, like everything short of welding, which means no mills, no lays. No, no, you know, no, no fun. Men, men, men no operation, if need be. <laughs> right. So all, all minimum requirement tools. So, uh, I, you know, my, my, my mention here before I let Jacob run some with this, with this, uh, the FGC nine, as we're calling it, the gun control nine, is a. Uh, uh, Je Jeff Rod has found a way using electrochemical machining, which for the uninitiated, as I was, uh, even just a couple of months ago. You can use salt water and an electrode, run enough current through it, and you can use electricity to machine metal. It doesn't matter how hard the metal is, so it doesn't matter if it's tungsten, it doesn't matter if it's 4140 hardened steel, it makes no difference because 
what 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 the way electrochemical machining works is instead of hardness being the limited factor, conductivity, like how much it conducts electricity, becomes the limiting factor. Is this like wire EDM? It, it's you know it's the same exact way more okay. or less that wire EDM works. Yeah, that's a, that's what what it sounded like to me when you mentioned it. I'm just not familiar. I'm not a machinist, but I'm familiar with the processes. So. Right, but Jeff Rod has this excellent write up on Imager, where uh, he's got uh, he he made a four I think it was 44 special barrel, and I think it was out of 4140 hardened steel, where he you know he he had the center already drilled out, so so it was like you know high strength hydraulic tubing, which to anyone who's uh, DIY gun centric that means it's like a barrel blank. And so he used like a 3D printed jig with copper wire wrapped around it as his electrode. And the 3D printed jig, you know, had rifling grooves in it, wrapped the copper wire around that, hooked one lead of a car battery to the outside of the barrel, one lead of the car battery to the electrode, and then run salt water past it using a pump. And it will machine rifling grooves into the barrel, you know, at a measurable, controllable rate based on the amount of current the battery is dumping. I mean, just absolutely bizarre. And then he chambered it. He, he even chambered it for 44 Special using another printed uh, 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 electrode. Just, it's just crazy. People don't realize what the weight of that is. Like, like, look, firearms around the world are regulated in certain ways. Most often, the barrel and the bolt are regulated. And the thing is, in most of the world, that is regulated. What is regulated in the United States? The frame. The frame, you can 3D print. But what you can't 3D print today is the barrel and the bolt. And that question you have to solve. And the thing is, this uh, design is all is based on the Shuddy AP9 by Derwood. He's another guy from Foscat. Shout out to him. And uh, the idea was with this uh, design to, uh, to, to modify it, to improve it, and to get rid of the barrel. Because Derwood's design used a Glock barrel, a Glock factory barrel. And the issue was people out there around the world can't just buy a Glock barrel. So yeah, we, we, of, we moved that out of the equation. In a lot of European countries, for example, uh, well, to prefix that in the US, like we mentioned earlier, the frames or sometimes the internal chassis or the lower receivers are the regulated part of the firearm. Everything else is free to buy. In a lot of the European countries and um, others, the barrels or the uh, slides or whatever um, specific pressure containing, you know, essential mechanical parts are what might be regulated as a firearm there and that this goes perfectly because you like you just mentioned you might not be able to buy the barrel or the slide or the part that's very difficult for the layman to make yeah and uh, the thing is in many uh, countries around the world where gun control is tight you still can't buy magazines you still can't buy airsoft rifles and you you know what's funny there are airsoft <laughs> rifles out there where you can actually use the lower receiver to make an real AR-15. And the, what's really interesting is that there are accounts on Twitter where they post images from the Middle East of some fucking terrorists who use firearms. And some of these firearms weirdly use airsoft lower receivers. Absolutely so, bizarre. So I remember, it's, it's really bizarre. I remember maybe 10-ish years ago that a specific airsoft rifle like had to get, I don't know if that was recalled or something like that. I'm sure some of the airsoft people in our chat who are familiar will will know this, but like, it was basically a one-to-one -one AR lower, and the ATF was like, yeah. this is a no-no, change it. Yeah. I remember that going around yeah, on case. An and... opinion letter saying that uh, air, you know, airsoft guns have to be regulated as if they're real guns, because they're all, well, they, they said they're all easily convertible. That's Just hilarious. trying to, you know, cast a wide enough net that a public backlash will make them retract it. So, so okay, all one-to-one -one lowers have to uh -huh. be regulated. As well. So also, why I mentioned uh, all that is that you can buy magazines and eventually you'll be able to make the magazine from scratch. But what's important about this design is that the fire control group in many countries isn't regulated. So the idea is to, to make a gun or a firearms design where as many parts of it or every part you can either build yourself, buy or, yeah, or get in some other ways pretty easily. And uh, with this firearms design, you only need the 3D printer you need a bunch of screws. You need some uh, some some uh, steel stock, or you can act. Actually, what's what's good about this design is, you can actually get uh, the barrel uh, in parentheses from an online shop. It's non-rifled. It's for example a nine millimeter in diameter. 
So you could use that um, that pipe in, in parentheses and cut it to length, and then chamber it with a with a flat cut uh, drill bit, um, and and then you have a smooth bore barrel. So you don't need even a lathe to create a barrel for this thing. So the barrel uh, problem is solved with this firearms design. And then the bolt, good thing about it, it's just two uh, two pieces of of steel rods. And those you weld together uh, with a really cheap, like 100 bucks um, stick welder. Mm -hmm. And every other part you print and the, the screws you, you can buy in the hardware store and the fire control group you can either take out of, the, of an airsoft rifle if it actually uses a, a real fire control group or you can, in many countries you can just buy the fire control group. And uh, and yeah, and, and then you have it. You have a path to a, to a nine millimeter firearm that uses Glock magazines, that uses AR-15 uh, fire control group, and that is actually pretty decent and ergonomic, yes. and uh, and uh, it's 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 incredible what you will be able to build soon. So, is the bolt on this design simple enough to actually um like crudely weld it using like car batteries? Fuck yeah! Fuck you, yeah. Could j you could JB weld it even. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 not extra and i guess if it's nine millimeters the pressures are relatively low so it's not super dangerous so neat that's really neat yeah i mean and you, if you, you could you could redneck weld it for sure also, like you were saying and if you uh, look at this look at this picture there's something that that will uh that will stand out try to look at the picture and and tell me there's something wrong with it right there's something you, you haven't seen before in the shuddy for example like like a certain hole can you make out where that hole is? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm laughing at that. The the one right there at the 12 o'clock is uh, with the arrow pointing to it, basically. Exactly. And the funny thing is, now that we uh, are making our own design, we can modify it. So so I asked Ivan, do you think we can make this firearms design uh, fully automatic and accept uh, M4, M16 fire control groups? And he says, what? probably. And and then he he went at it and actually modified it. So that it could actually work. So we haven't tested it out yet, but it's it's theoretical right now. Yeah, so ATF, don't don't shoot my dog, don't shoot my dog. <laughs> your, coat, your coat hanger, your coat hanger lightning links or your 3D printed lightning. Well, I guess swift links would be better than a lightning link specifically, but your your 3D printed slip links or your coat hangers or your drop in auto sears that can be easily machined. Uh, this I mean, this one we designed around a GI auto sear, which you can just buy at least yeah, in you're just, America, at least you in the just US. buy off the shelf. Yeah, and th there's a couple of like the Wish.com Chinese places that will sell worldwide. Of course, I'm sure it's cast in pot metal, but, uh, but ours doesn't actually write on the bolt carrier. Right, yeah. and ours, ours doesn't even write on the bolt carrier. So you can and just also, get your Wish.com like zinc alloy casted auto sear and then go to town. I and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think some places like Germany don't even care if that hole's there. Like this would actually probably be okay there. It's all the other parts they don't like. I know in Switzerland they don't give a shit. Well, I, I know a guy who I'm not going to mention has a uh, an HK lower receiver, so, so, yeah, yeah. So whatever their uh, M416 or whatever, yeah, and it's got the third lower. pin hole drilled, and they don't care over it. Like I believe it's like that with the because uh, uh, I think what is it? Zib Militaria is the big German distributor, and I, they have uh, HK416 lowers by like the thousands and. That isn't the controlled part in that area. Right. And, they don't yeah, so everybody that is listening right now, everybody that's listening, the fucking lawmakers will catch up on this and they yeah. will try to ban these components. So everybody that's listening, buy as much fire con auto fire control groups as you can, Absolutely. buy as many lower and upper receivers. Get, maybe get or maybe or you, might wanna, you might want to order them under a different name, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Or yeah. order like twenty in your own name from the same website. <laughs> <Right. laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, it's legal. Buy as much as you can. Stock up now because trust me, these motherfuckers will will ban the shit out of everything that we actually still can buy. So guys, um, yeah. You know, you I mean, mentioned and at the very least, like what what does the vet look to put a dog down? Like a hundred bucks or whatever. The ATF <laughs> will do it for free. Yeah. Oh no. All you need. To all you need to do is grab a set of my, uh, metal files and make like a funny looking beer opener, post it on the internet, and they'll show up at your. It's just all yellers on your last legs there. You gotta be economic <laughs> about it. So, you guys mentioned earlier, though, about how some places' magazines aren't controlled. It's really funny because I have a dozen plus magazines I've bought from the UK for a reason. It I've gotten these specific magazines of a few different types for maybe a tenth of the price from the UK. That I could find them in the U.S. 
Yeah, um, it's crazy. I, I have a pile of HK416 mags. Uh, I have friends who bought AK Bake Lights for 74s and 40 and AKMs and, uh, and FAL magazines from there. And um, it's it just, it's funny because it's like, that's one of those scenes. And they're super cheap there because no one has guns for them. And guys, um, even if you even if you are unlucky and uh, the government bans things and you didn't get your hands on it in time, we are actually thinking about printing parts of the fire control group and putting like metal bits in it that we have like a G36 fire control group that is actually part polymer and has metal inlays in it. You know, Ivan mentioned it earlier. I'm sure like you could put JV Fold on top of the stress parts and at least get it to right. function you for a little at least bit. Try. Or yeah, one I, thought that I had was, I know Foscad has done like ABS printed fire control groups at last a couple shots. I was wondering because I'm I'm gonna take on like lost PLA aluminum casting using a backyard forge here for the Glock yeah. rails. Something I'm gonna try is making an aluminum fire control group. I doubt it'll last up extremely long term because aluminum likes to gall and wear away. But if you could make it like 200 shots on an AR fire control group that you cast it in aluminum, you could probably harden it too. You know, I uh, message, it, yeah. message me after the show and uh, get me on that. Um, I have a friend here. He comes to, so where I'm stationed at, he comes to our house um, to do uh, different kinds of metal forging uh, because we got space in our backyard for it. And this is something that like the both of us would uh, probably be happy to like try to take on and figure out with that as well. Um, and we're probably going to move on from aluminum to other metals, but right yeah, uh, that that would be something like fun and neat and interesting. Also, yeah, there's, there's it, this is proof of concept stuff too. Like, like you said, you, just JP Weld stuff. <laughs> All right, or something that Jeff Rod has done before. Again, we're back to Jeff Rod over and over again. He's casted parts in JB Weld before for his shotgun. So he, he made a breech block yeah. for it out of JB Weld, and it lasted like, you know, 20, 30 shots at 12 gauge, and it's still going. That's wonderful. Some a... guy has a question here. He asks, what is that uh, external lever? So what you see here on the side of the gun uh, up there, you see uh, the uh, charging handle, that knurled one, that round one, and below that there's a pivoted um, actuator or lever or whatever. And the, the genius uh, thing about this firearm is that it doesn't have a traditional extractor or ejector, but what it actually does is as the bolt gets, um, goes, gets backward, the pivot pushes the casing from, from, from the left side, if you like from our side from this image, to uh, behind the gun, so it kicks it out. So if you, if you Google uh, on YouTube, uh, AP, shot the AP9 slow motion, you can actually see it in action. So it's a pretty genius uh, design. Um, how the casings are kicked out, and uh, the big issue with this with this fully automatic one is that you that we have to time the 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 autos here getting actu actuated. So it's got it's going to be a challenge. Uh, actually, we're not going to build it. We're just going to maybe put out the files that there are other people who are not in the jurisdiction of the ATF can experiment with it, or maybe SOTs who can legally do yeah, it. Exactly. Say. That's why I'm trying uh, to headhunt in 0207. Uh, hey, we have a friend who will probably be interested in that as well who might help you out. We'll see. Right on. Yeah. Um, so, I, we yeah. have a couple who might be. We'll see uh, what they can do. Also, the stock on here, no, it's not a stock, it's a brace. And even if it's not a brace, it's optional. So you don't have to actually actually <laughs> use it. So, who so cares? It's, if it's got a giggle switch, it was technically. Yeah. Yeah. If, if it's a machine gun, it cannot be a short-barreled rifle. It's ATF. only a machine gun. So yeah. you'll only be able to shoot one dog over it. It's not even that big a deal. Yeah. Oh, oh no. man. I, I hope the ATF is not listening. Just write they're not always, a stock on it. Maybe they're always listening. Yeah, just write you not know, a stock on or it. Or not an auto sear inside of the trigger. <laughs> not an auto sear. <laughs> not a machine gun on the side of it. It's not a rate accelerator per se. Yeah. You know, I have a, I had a pretty interesting idea. Um, on, I might go with you guys. I might go over it after the show just because it's not completely fleshed out yet. But you guys are probably be super interested in it. And eventually, when it is fleshed out, uh, when it, when that time comes, um, uh, we could probably have you guys back on to discuss that. But um, just remind me. We'll make a note of it. And uh, when we're done here, I think you guys would love to um, hear about it. Sounds good. Cool. So, by the way, uh, if people have any questions uh, for me or Ivan or in general about do-it-yourself guns or where to buy parts and stuff, just just sh uh, shoot a question in, in the chat. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna answer them. Okay, and, I'm, uh, I'm going to look for a screenshot really quick. So, I'm, I'm gonna let's see.
Also, there might have been questions we missed in that chat. I haven't been uh, looking at it very hard. Actually, um, like, uh, do you guys want to play the 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 Glock 17 frame trailer? Actually, that'd Real be quick. awesome. And I, I had something I wanted to mention. Uh, our printer we have here, my roommate bought the printer originally for about $300. It's a 320 by 320. No, sorry, 350 by 350 by 370 millimeter printer. So a very large um, Core XY Chinese printer. He's invested a few hundred dollars more into it since then to make it print better. Um, but I mean, like, you guys were talking economics earlier, and printers are getting cheaper. There's a lot of... Sorry if you guys hear my dog crying back here. There's a there's a lot of like decent, affordable, cheap printers, and especially for something as small as a Glock frame. And we're in a time now where these printers are not the fifteen hundred dollar maker bots that people needed once upon a time. Um, like this is affordable and attainable to average people that might just want to buy something on a whim to try to say, hey, I want to do this. And this specific theme with this Glock frame is really cool because of that. And those PMAGs. Yeah, the, the good thing about <clears throat> the 3D printing technology lately is that you really can get yourself a, 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 a Creality Ender 3 for like 180 bucks. Like there's a, if you click on one of the links I posted, you should be able to find the Creality Ender 3 for 181 US dollars shipped to your door without any additional uh, custom taxes. And so awesome. the, 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 the entry barrier is really low, guys. So if, if you want, you can print yourself a, a Glock frame or just um, print yourself accessories or soon the FGC9. And um, yeah, like lots of stuff is, is coming, guys. So the, the future is looking bright. I'm I'm waiting for somebody to print out you know like a hundred of these frames, keep them in a box or whatever, and then take them to a buyback. I'm yeah. waiting for this to happen. <laughs> these, fr oh, yeah. these frames are four bucks a piece, and if they give you a hundred dollars a frame, think of, think of how many like I don't know FAL twenty dollars a frame. Who cares? Right. <laughs> a gift what, what, card. Does it, what, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is that you love, you could go and buy that many more of them. Or just, you know, just take up that much of the anti-gunners resources. Who exactly. fucking cares? You, you could just you could shred the gift cards. It doesn't matter. Uh, like, do you know you know what's problematic maybe about this idea of, of, uh, of stocking uh, frames? There's lots of talk uh, going on lately when we release the trailer that maybe uh, the fucking legislators will, will do the same in the U.S. as in Europe and regulate firearms uh, by restricting... Uh, barrels and bolts so th that's a thing that's gonna be it's good maybe maybe it's gonna come who knows maybe the next democratic president will 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 try to uh, to, to to get that idea into into public discourse man and, and and if that happens who knows what will happen and I, i've that's something that i've researched a lot and i'm glad you brought up that I, I've done a lot of reading as well as I stumbled upon like the transcripts of when like the 64 Gun Control Act, which was like, you know, that's when they decided what, you know, that, that serial numbers are required is basically the big, big part that came out, came out of that. But uh, the reading that I did around then was a lot of that debate centered around what, what is it that we require the serial number on? So beyond we're going to require serial numbers, it's what do we need a serial number on? So the big consensus was we've got things that have been serialized in the past. So, you know, for, 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 you know, a ARs at that point had no, no AR, ARs had not, no, they had been around, right? AR was 59. And AR 15 was out at that point. So, yes. so for example, AR 15 lowers were, the AR 15 lowers were serialized at that point in time. 1911 frames were serialized at that point in time. So you had all these guns out there at that point in history, maybe, a, you know, maybe a hundred million guns were out there. And they all bore serial numbers somewhere. And so even the most rapidly anti-gun, let's say, because I'm sure they didn't actually have people making these at home in mind, but even if they had said, well, now all barrels need to be serialized, you've got probably at least 100, around 100 million guns now that are not serialized properly. So in order for the government to impose on you that you have to go and get that serialized, they will have to pass another law and they will have to write that into the federal budget, which we both know in today's day and age would not happen you'd see another government shut down for a long time and all sorts of nightmare over that because it would cost a great deal of money to force everyone to go and serialize their guns. 
to be honest, it actually wouldn't be that much of a big deal. Like they would uh, enact uh, firearms manufacturers to, to produce all barrels, all bolts, and all uh, slides to have serial numbers all, put on them. And all that, going that's, that's forward, pretty easy. that's true. All going forward, that's true. But I mean, so, so the, the number that gets tossed around is there's 300 million guns in the United States. And I, I think that's a gross underestimation based on the past analysis I've done on that number. Actually, but let's say it is 300 million. There's people that, uh, there's actually a study that was done very recently that, that they think that is closer to 450, 440 million on the low end right now because right. And, of. And I, I could absolutely, so, so I think maybe as high as 500 million. Yes. And that, so that's how many guns in terms of, you know, serialized guns there are. How many? Well, so, so how how many people own more lowers than they do or uppers than they do lowers for AR? I have a couple of eighty percent. I'm in here. that group. How, how many people have more barrels than they do registered guns? Yep. How many stores on their shelves have more barrels than they do guns that they they're going to fill out background checks? All right, but wait, you're you, gonna need a, you're gonna need a, you're gonna need a warrant before you ask very, very right. many more questions here. <laughs> so 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 you've got. You know, 500 million guns maybe, but I guarantee you, you have double that in uppers, in barrels, in parts that they would want to regulate that are currently not regulated. So you've got 500 million bolts inside of AR, you know, 500 million bolts in guns that aren't serialized, that aren't regulated, that aren't in any sort of database, NICs or otherwise. And that's just the ones in the guns. Counting the ones that are on shelves or the ones that are counted out, you know, set separately, maybe double that number. So you're looking at maybe up to a billion maybe uh, unserialized parts out there, you're going to create the biggest black market on the face of God's earth. Okay. If, 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 you, if you enact that law. So now you've got a billion parts that you wish to regulate that you don't even know if that many exist that you can't regulate. And in order to force those people to serialize them would be, unconstitu would be unconstitutional if you wrote a law that says everyone has to go and serialize all of the parts of all of their guns. You will have to write that into the budget and reimburse people to have, you know, so the government pays you to let you, so, so the government has to pay for having those guns serialized. They cannot force you to go out and serialize them on your own without an additional law and without passing that in the budget. And so as a result of that, it's, it's, it's a mess. Okay, now I think you convinced me that is something that the anti-gunners couldn't use to, to fuck us gun people. But what they could do and what, what will be really what would put a devastating blow to the gun community and to the second amendment. And it's, it, it's, it, it works because ammunition, you have to always have to buy it. It's a consumable item. Uh, you can't just uh, have it in the population and, and, uh, and in, in 20 years, it's still there. No, people will need to consume their ammo because they will go to the shooting ranges. So if they actually regulated ammo and if you had, if you needed the license to buy ammo, then people would be fucked. And, and I, that's agree. that's the vector that's the vector anti-gunners should take exactly and i and i agree with the, as far as in, in, as far as long-term solution if they regulated bolts and barrels eventually the supply of unregulated ones will dry up that said i think you're looking at like a hundred plus years to yeah. dry those up because everyone's going to have the one they don't tell anyone about and with ammo it's much quicker there's right. still and, stuff coming up in australia that they that found in true. 20 to 30 they're, they're, years ago yeah. sks is in you know one of a gentleman that we know just bought a buttload of seven. He's legally this this gentleman, but uh, <laughs> he just bought a buttload of seven six two by thirty nine from Nurinko that was in suspiciously like dirty milk jugs or water jugs. You know. You know what's it's, really it's wonderful? Funny how that happens. You know what's really wonderful about California trying to uh, to re to to regulate uh, ammo. Even if they introduced it, I, I don't know if they have already. Even if you needed the license to buy ammo in California. Who stops you from calling a friend in Texas and say, hey, buddy, can you send me uh, 10,000 uh, rounds of ammo in boxes that are labeled, uh, I don't know. Uh, dishwasher parts. Dishwasher parts. train parts. Yeah. Or just getting components, you so know. I, and yeah. once they ban formal Make components, people are going to start printing 3D cases or 3D printing cases and using match heads for primer and ignition if they have yeah, to. Yeah, that's going to take a while until until that becomes practical for the average Baba Fat. It, it, it won't, it. but it's the, 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 if there's a will, there will be yeah, yeah. So unless they, they federally, like every state regulates ammo and you have to have to li a license for it, it's impossible for the anti-gunners to do anything. So 
so gun control in America is, is a moot point. And in 20 years, when, when we have a solution for smokeless powder, when we can metal print our guns, there will be no gun control. Gun control will be dead for real. Yeah, and it's on its way there because of people like you guys and communities like ours, you know. It's not going to stop, and it's only going to get bigger. And the more people try to stop it, the more people will fight it. Because big deals are made about this, it, people are like, no, okay, we're not going to take part of it. That's the one of the funniest parts. Be stopped. That's one of the funniest parts about this all, too, is if... if Years ago, after the you know original Liberator pistol, after the original printed AR lowers, if no one paid that any mind, it wouldn't be a pressing matter today, in my honest opinion. There would still be people out there, like hobbyists, who would uh, be pursuing this stuff, just like there's people who are doing um, other forms of DIY firearms. But if it wasn't for people, uh, and specifically like media figures and politicians, saying this is dangerous, to, you know, and trying to fight it so hard to ban it without any like really good reason at all there would not be this vehement or this community that is like vehemently opposing it but they created it and this is their own doing you know and we're all that products was, i think probably one of my more more most favorite cody wilson quotes is uh talking about how bef i think it was after their indiegogo was shut down his quote was the printed gun is dead now long live the printed gun because no one gave a shit 100%. about the weak weapon no one gave a shit about death cad until they got negative press, until they were shut down yep. in Indiegogo or GoFundMe, until things went wrong with, wrong for them, nothing went right. Yep. By yeah. the way, guys, uh, if you still have any questions, feel free to ask. How doesn't matter how ridiculous they, so they sound. Um, yeah. Let's see. Let's, let's look in the chat really quick. Yeah, precisely. Anything at all is totally welcome. You guys have the floor. So in general, what people can expect in the future is after we have released uh, the frame, which will be tomorrow, um, we will focus on a Glock 17 magazine. And uh, after that has um, gone out of the door, we will focus on the FGC and make it release ready. That will take a while. And and what I wanted to ask you people, if you know anybody who's who's working for RDEC or who is in, in certain circles of the gun industry and and they could send us blueprints our way, feel free to ask them and uh, that would be absolutely welcome, especially for the AR-15, AR-3, uh, A3, M4 and uh, M16, A3 and A4. If, if you guys... Uh, know anybody and have connections to get us blueprints feel free to send ivan the mm -hmm. email to his proton mail account i'm pretty sure that the tdp for the m4 is out there it exists it's just kind of hard to find but it was accidentally leaked by the government itself because cole owns the tdp for the m4 i read that too yeah um but i'll do some digging and see what we can find so i see from kimbro slice what's the best inexpensive printer on the market for printing block frames uh, this it, undoubtedly is going to be the Creality Ender or the Anycubic i3 Mega. I personally would go the Ender route, but I have guys that swear by the i3 Mega. So uh, either way you want to go, it's like the $200, $250 price range. You won't have automatic bed leveling. The hot end can't get much hotter than 250 Celsius, but that's hot enough for ABS. That's hot enough for PLA. And, and all that stuff you could swap out in your own, by the way. Right, and so, so you can upgrade hot end, so... Honestly, if you just want to get into it without investing a whole lot of money, get yourself a Creality Ender, play with it, print some Mayhar lowers, print some Glock frames with it. Once you're ready for the next step up, you're left with a choice. You can upgrade to a Perusa and have two printers, or you can just build up your Ender, put a better hot end on it, uh, well, potentially even upgrade the board on it, and then go where it is and what from there. Very much so. So the route we went, uh, my roommate, he bought a Trunksy X5S on a whim because uh, it was on Walmart's website. Trunksy is one of the many Chinese printer brands actually in our opinion one of the better ones right now um we didn't know that going in and he's upgraded various things like motors he upgraded linear rails the new models do have automatic bed leveling his model does not he upgraded the hot end anyways he spent about 300 on this printer um and invested a couple hundred more into it but the thing is you know for you know, six seven hundred invested total uh is as capable as prusa and uh Cruises, by the way, guys, for anyone listening and not familiar, are kind of like the gold standard of printers right now. 
Um, they're pretty like headache free. You could just buy them for about a thousand bucks and uh, be ready to go out of the box for most things. And a pretty good um, professional support from the company. Uh, the Tronx CX-5S has a good community around it. And like you said, the Creality also. There's a lot of good options. Um, at that point, when you buy a printer, you might want to look into buying. Obviously, we're discussing guns and Glock frames. Uh, you might there's there's definitely things that exist uh, that you might be interested in printing that you know might also sway what you want to do. Uh, just make sure you can do different filaments like ABS, and you'll be good to go. Yeah, for the Glock frame, we recommend PLA Plus, like Eastern PLA Plus. You can get it on Amazon for twenty two bucks. And guys. Just get yourself uh, Ender 3 for 180 bucks, and you can do do non-gun stuff with it. Like for example, uh, like like yesterday, I there was like a bracket for my for my fridge door that broke, and I took my caliper and uh, uh, reverse engineered it, and in, in a few minutes I printed a new bracket and I fixed my uh, fridge door. So. So guys, it's extremely useful. Like, uh, just just buy one. The next time you you have you have your birthday, uh, ask your significant other to to pay uh, you the money for getting getting a printer or for Christmas or whatever, and and uh, and play around with it. And when the time comes and we release our FGC, you can build yourself a pistol caliber carbine. And who can do that for 180 bucks? And uh, and it's it's really a fun thing to learn how to model to print things. It's it's a really fun hobby, and it's actually useful and well, and can help you maybe find a job someday. One hundred percent. We've done a handful of gun related things with our printer. We also have a ghost gunner that has been gathering dust that we're borrowing from another friend sitting in our room. And that that thing I'm going to use eventually to build up my eighties. Our printer. We've done a handful of fun things with gun related, but most of the stuff has been related to like cosplay props and such. Um, I'm making a helmet from a uh, from Goblin Slayer right now. Um, we've made a handful of like actual useful things. I made leather stamps of all things using a PLA um, to actually stamp leather like you would for metal. And that actually came out really well. Just uh, outside of our, you know, imminent like uh, or exact topic of discussion for this, which is obviously firearm related, um, printer technology in general is super neat. And uh, everyone should get into it. It's really cool. And very, it's really affordable to do right now. And by the way, you don't have to uh, use a 3D printer to make your own firearms. Uh, there are a couple of PDFs out there where they show you how to to build a luthi style um, firearm out of hardware store parts. Just Google Professor Parabellum or look into the Murder Cube or whatever 4chan uh, compilations there are out there for firearm related parts. And those Professor Parabellum PDFs are really a cool way to get, get started even with other 3, 3D printers. So if you have a dad and he has a garage and, and welder, a welder and a, a bunch of metal tools, get started like that. You don't need even, even a, a 3D printer, but for 180 bucks, guys, it's a fucking bargain. Yeah, some of the old fags on K are going to remember uh, Johnny Labs, the basement machinist, doing a whole cut, whole lot of uh, basement uh, firearm pipe gun stuff. Um, there's been a, um, I want to say it was Ivan who did uh, the um, Iron Glock. If you guys are familiar with that, he basically Many welded items. up an internal steel frame for a, a airsoft Glock frame, and then made that work with a uh, commercial parts kit. Um, there's a handful of other things like that that are out there. He did a uh, fruity air lowers. Uh, he basically, instead of doing a Palmer 3D printed lower, he um, made a rever he reversed a mold and actually like molded a silicon or whatever Palmer AR lower, and just like or, or tons of them rather, using just like some some commercial Dupont uh, two part you know Palmers. It was really neat. And it all goes to the point that you're not going to stop any of this, whether it's printer related or not. Actually, I have something that you guys might be interested in. So um, I know Carl on InRange has mentioned this before, but uh, what do you guys think about how, or what what do you what are your guys' thoughts on printer companies, especially like more formal ones like uh, MakerBot and uh, maybe Prusa, that will limit the types of files that their printers can actually do versus the open source stuff now. And oh man, that, that's such a silly idea. Yeah, I, I like guys. You know what's happened? What happens with video games, right? When there's a crack, 
Well, I mean, when, when there's a protected oh, co copyright, what do you do? You, you go to Pirate Bay and download a fucking crack and install it. Do you, don't you think that will happen with the 3D printers? Oh, I, I, there's already custom firmwares out there for all of the stuff. And if it's if hopeless these, for the companies. And if the Western companies want to do that, there's the Chinese companies that won't give a shit. So, um, but I feel like that might be a concern for the more mainstream printers coming into the future, just because, you know, things do get political, but hopefully it won't, because that would also be like a super big drag to uh, not stay open source for a whole host of reasons. It will probably be a bad, like, you know, fiscal move. So I see that the guy has a question. Doom Trooper 83 asks, um, that even the famous maker of the AK-47 had regrets of making his weapon. Do you, do any of uh, those thoughts sometimes come around in your own minds while going through this? Granted, I'm a full supporter of your cause, but that question comes to my mind. So the thing about firearms is, and gun rights is, that it's, it is always a trade-off of safety and liberty. And for me personally, liberty is much more important in my life. If I'm not free, if I'm in a cage, if I'm on my knees, I would rather die. That's the reason why our motto or slogan is live free or die. And that's all that's all we are about and for me personally even if there is a criminal who knows that builds a fgc9 and does something with it i don't care because you know why maybe there's some other guy who liberates who liberates his uh his hometown from invaders or something it's all about what what the people what the human whom what the, what the people out there do if they have bad intentions my design won't won't uh, stop them. They will yeah. just go to the black market. What They're going do to think? do it regardless. There's going to be a, where there is a will, whether it's for good or bad. Where there is a will, there is the way. Um, anyone, if they if it's not a gun, it'll be something else. And if it is a gun, it, if it's not yours, it'll be another one. Um, it doesn't matter if you're in the U.S. or any other country. If that if that hasn't been made clear to everyone, um, I don't know, especially with recent events. But it's. It should be, I there's no argument against that. And this isn't the easiest way to do this either. That's the other thing. I mean, we're trying to make it easier, but uh, people, it, they're, your street level, you know, criminals are not going to go get, be buying 3D printers to go be printing Glocks and paying for it all for Glock parts kits. So, yeah. So I see, uh, I see uh, from crayons, uh, rail or gauss guns. So I was wondering about this the other day. Well, specifically, I was wondering about pneumatic guns. I just got done playing the new Metro Exodus. And I <laughs> liked it a lot. And so, of course, the coolest gun in the game is the pneumatic sniper rifle. But so I was wondering, I do think pneumatic guns have a place. And I do think that potentially, I know there's a company that makes for some ignorance those, much more than a worth amount of money. They have an automatic Gauss rifle uses magnetic acceleration for ball bearings and shoots in full auto. And they ask way too much money for it, so I don't think I'll ever buy one. But down the road, I think that is absolutely something viable. I think that is something that you could see from uh, Foscat or similar in you know, 10, 15 years from now. I think you absolutely could see it. Uh, I don't know if, if you want it to be like a, like a tension-powered weapon, like a, a, a bow that's – you know, a bow that shoots at firearms level uh, velocities, if it's something compressed air, if it's something magnet powered. Those uh, Air Force Texan air guns, those 30 cal ones, those take down large game. You know, yeah, that's large true. Game. I, I know that there is, I know there is like an air rifle that shoots a 357 yep, projectile. That's, that's what I'm talking about. One of our friends uses it. Shoots, to shoots it at however many thousands this. of feet per second. I mean, yep. it shoots it as if it was a. Yep. Yeah, no, those are uh, they, they're, those are real, and also those are completely unregulated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good point. As well as like black powder cap and ball revolvers, completely unregulated. I definitely don't know people who are under the age of twenty one in California who are buying black powder revolvers over the counter and then ordering the you know conversion cylinder right. over the internet. <laughs> I did have a quick question. This was uh, shared before, but I didn't put it on screen. Uh, what is this exactly? So, so what screen so what you see on on this screen right here is the beginning of my uh, do-it-yourself 
uh, gun carry or hobby. So what this is, it's a single shot firearm that a, uh, a feller on YouTube uh, showcased. And what I try to do is, hey, that looks like a simple design and it works for 38 Special. It's what it's designed for, uh, for a black powder 38 Special cartridge. So I watched this video, but he never showed any schematics or any like dimensions or something. So to, you know what crazy thing I did? I stopped at certain points in, the, in this video where he showed his firearm like in a, in, a, in a side shot and I screenshotted it and I tried to figure out, hey, he talked about that component that it was, uh, I don't know, so-and-so inches thick. And then I basically tried to reverse engineer this firearm from this video, from this fucking YouTube video in low resolution. So then I, I started to learn with Fusion 360 what, what CAD modeling is. Like I basically, with this firearm model, I, I learned how to model a firearm. So I, I took, uh, so basically this firearm is composed of, uh, of three layers. The middle layer is a six uh, millimeter um, aluminum, aluminum uh, spacer. And then there are uh, two um, steel uh, plates on the left and right. And then with, with simple little gizmos, uh, and um, and screws and, and 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 stock pieces that you thread, you basically build yourself a, a single shot uh, pistol. And and what what's so cool about this is that the uh, iron sights, for example, are three D printed and are even three D printed. So the the actual front sight that you see on here that that envelops the the barrel is actually the first thing I ever three D printed. The first thing I ever three D printed in my life is a, is a is a part that I designed myself. And uh, and it's a fucking gun part. That's so terrific. it's That's it's awesome. crazy. And uh, and this firearm actually, um, I don't know. Maybe we'll release it sometime soon. And uh, you you guys just need a three D printer and uh, a, a, like a cheap milling machine, and and you can build it uh, yourself at home. Yeah, yeah, it's very neat. I, uh, there's also those um, AR lowers that have came out recently, or at least they were announced sometime in the last few months that are similar to that, or you could just bolt them together. There's no stopping any of it. And the more the more people fight against it, the more they're going to feel the fire of the people from our community who will keep innovating, uh, keep finding workarounds. There are so many decent farm uh models out there and, and designs like for example what really went under under the radar and what's what's really kind of tragic is that like everybody knew about Coley Wilson and his liberator right there was a I don't know if it was a Japanese guy or whoever somebody designed like a like a pistol that uh, uses like laminated sheets and 3d printed parts to, to make like a kind of like a revolver and and that seemed like a really cool design there are so many cool designs out there like there's a there's a guy from Japan who who designed his own firearm and the Japanese police unfortunately incarcerated him, and that guy uh, has a Twitter account and and he he um, I think he I posted, remember this. He posted a, like, a link about various firearms designs, and I, actually there is an entry on Wiki, Wikipedia about various firearms designs, and you guys should should take a look and and. Uh, yeah, take a look at the firearms designs, download them, learn. I implore you guys to, to download Autodesk Fusion 360. It's actually for free if you uh, say you're a student, even if you're not, doesn't matter. And then open up that uh, software and just go to GrabCAD, download all that crap that is on there and futz around with it and try to learn with it. And, and if you have a 3D printer, don't be shy to design your own components. And it's, it's a really fun thing. And once you get the hang of it, it's a really powerful thing. And if, if you want to... I don't know. Design your own uh, accessory for your for your AR-15. Like, if for example, if you wanted to, I don't know, like design a design a foregrip that is shaped like a penis, you could do that totally. Uh, like the, the the possibilities are endless, guys. The possibilities are endless. But you know what I fear when we release the Glock frame. The, what what the weebs will do with the frame? Like what kind? Oh, of... I'm already. I'm hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Oh man! We have made the decision that we are now only releasing the ST. <laughs> there will be no weeb <laughs> shit on this project. Sorry. Wait a minute. What? <laughs> we are not releasing the step? Nope. It's just the STL now because I don't want any weeb shit on my guns. Oh, don't worry. Like, 
hey, if you guys aren't uh, yourselves a testament to, well, we're going to do what we want to, <laughs> and, uh, the weebs will be. They're going to take your STL, and they will go through the pain in the ass process of making that the object file, and uh, so that they can do what they want with it. We will release object and model files. Well, that's the that's the beauty about all this all this three D printing, do it yourself yes. stuff that everybody can modify it to to with their own wishes. For example, what what will be really gnarly is like tons of people on shooting ranges all over the U.S. having Glock 17s on the shooting range that are like in the weirdest colors, and people will be, "What the fuck do you have in your hands? I've never seen a Glock that looks like that." It's gonna be funny. Or a Glock oh, with yeah. a custom hand guard, or a Glock with a custom grip angle, or yeah, I don't know. Oh man, if you if you, if you freaks want to put like your dragon dildos on your Glock grip, I don't know, I don't know what you 4chan folk do. Oh, but... if you don't want to do it on a print, we have a friend at uh, lasers. He has a he has a he has a uh, laser laser engraver. cutter. Yeah. We, he has a laser, laser engraver. We've done we've done P mags, Glock frames, uh, ARs, everything you can think of on the design. He's just uh, hey, throw it at the laser, and uh, he's happy to do it for a uh, very small. So, shout out to uh, Bliss out in Bryan, Texas. <laughs> but yeah, this, I mean, the sky's the limit because whenever the AR-15 printable lowers first hit FOSCAD, uh, FOSCAD did some changes to make them you know, a little bit stronger, make them last a little bit better, make them so weaker materials could work in them. But then they really hit, like, the customization. Like, I don't know if you guys have seen, like, the crazy bullpups, like War Fairy. And, oh, uh, I remember when done. War Fairy was posting on K with the original Sharon lower. Yeah, and, um, and just all, all the crazy customization and integrated bipods into the lower and all this just amazing stuff. I, I mean, maybe this is a little bit like egotistical and long-sighted of me, but I can see this the Glock project going the same way where – 100%. Mean, it's something like that's a, very a bull easy pup, to build a off of pup, and improve. Like a bullpup Glock grip that's like actually a pistol caliber carbine so it can get around the short-barreled rifle laws or – yeah, I mean, and to change up the grip however you like, change up the, I mean, change it however you like. Yep. So we got and, a question. And then ideally, the same drop-in rails could work in any of them. So you could take your rails out of one before if you didn't you want to make it, a second set of rails and go to ten. Before you know it, you're going to have people putting MCX stocks or braces or anything else <laughs> that they can imagine to. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So Cray, Cray Zad on in the chat asks, if I wanted to get into firearms design, where should I start? First thing is learn about firearms design. And I don't know, it may, be, it, it may sound stupid to UK folks because you know that guy already, but that guy, Ian from Forgotten Weapons, he has tons of videos about all those kinds of obscure firearms. He always talks about the, the firearms design uh, process. So if you watch those videos, you will kind of get a feeling of how firearms work. And then what, you, what I recommend to you is Get yourself a, a free license for Autodesk Fusion 360. Install that on your computer. And then download, for example, our AR-15 release. And then futz around with it, like modify it. And then, for example, like I talked about, uh, about uh, that already, I talked about the PDFs, uh, those Professor Parabellum PDFs. Download them and then make screenshots of those, uh, uh, of those, of those uh, crude schematics of those firearms and then load them into, into Fusion 360 and try to use that sketch uh, function to, to trace the lines. And then slowly but surely try to create something inside of Fusion 360. And Start then... simple. Start simple, something that can be used off a 22 long rifle and go from there. Be like, okay, now can I make this uh, self-loading with a small spring? You know, the more you tinker, you will figure it um, make something basic. Make something basic and futz around with designs and 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 for example, the single shot is really simple. Or or make maybe, make a make a pipe shotgun. That if is, you're not if you're not doing it in CAD, or oh, exactly. If you're not doing it in CAD with a printer, you can do this with hardware store parts too. You can get a 22 caliber pipe and go and legally make your own firearm based off of that. You can start with a basic slam fire and then you can go from there and make it a self loading and figure out your trigger mechanism and whatnot. Um, and Everyone starts somewhere. Uh, you mentioned Ian earlier. Ian's a mechanical engineer. That's his formal learning. But it's not like he went to school to become a expert on firearms. He got to the point of being an expert where he is today um, by just learning more and more about them out of his own self-interest and motivation. And look at where that's gone. He's a legitimate top-tier expert on um, obscure and forgotten weapons. <laughs> and that is not something that you learn in any way. They're just by having a passion for it and uh, doing your own self-learning with, you know, 
freely available internet resources. And the amount of resources we have access to for all of this is uh, astounding. You can find how to's on YouTube or anywhere, really. So. So I've got another question here from Recon Reconsider uh, WOT. I think that that's, that stands for World of Tanks, yeah. right? <laughs> so is there a version of Jeff Roth's ECM insert that is, that's just insert? I don't necessarily uh, un understand that question, but, but that's a really uh, exciting thing in general. J Jeff Roth's um, ECM process to make a barrel to chamber one. And I think that's one of the biggest things that will uh, that will change change the whole landscape. Because, for example, that will not only be interesting, for example, for FGC design, where you could uh, ECM your your, ri your rifle barrel, but other people can could use it as well. For example, somebody could make a, a liberator that is actually multi-shot and that that wouldn't break down uh, after one shot. You know, so that's something you have to uh, to look out. Yeah, he said the file he found on the GitHub had many different objects inside of it, but I haven't seen the file myself, so. Um, we'll see. All right, wonderful. So I guess that's it. Uh, we're nearing the end of our show here. Thank you all so much for joining us here tonight and interacting on stream. And... Special thanks to Ivan and Sark joining us here on the Commando Blog Podcast. Check out Deterrence Dispensed and follow their awesome projects. Uh, Ivan can be found on Twitter as IvanTheTroll12, and Stark can be found on Reddit as JStark1809. Uh, if you, the viewers and listeners, would like to support us here at the Commando Blog, check out the, pan uh, the panel below our stream if you're watching on Twitch, and uh, follow our social media. Uh, and if you'd like to become a patron, you can follow us on Patreon as well. Uh, again, thank you so much for popping into the stream. This is a very popular one, very special one, uh, 3D printing firearms. That's awesome. Thank you.